Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come back, Mother? Today, you? You What's the secret? The, dead come the, secret. Come the Lost Tragedy by Dennis McHale Mr. Bunstable's bookshop represents a type of establishment which has pretty well disappeared from our modern cities. Indeed, but for the fear of becoming involved in correspondence with strangers, I should be prepared to go considerably further and to say that it's the only shop of its kind still in existence. In any case, it's most distinctly and unmistakably a survival from the past. As all who have considered the subject must agree, the principal object of any bookseller is to obstruct, as far as possible, the sale of books. The method generally adopted today is to fill the premises with intelligent young men with knobby foreheads who chase intending customers from shelf to shelf, thrusting novels at antiquarians, theological works at novel readers, and two-volume biographies at those who obviously can't afford them, until finally they have chased their victims right out into the street. This is called scientific salesmanship and is largely responsible for the profits shown by the circulating libraries. The old-fashioned method was directed at the same end, but by a totally different route. The intending customer was left utterly and entirely to himself. If he knew what he wanted to read, he read it without let or hindrance and equally without payment. If he were just vaguely in search of an unidentified book, um, let us suppose for a wedding present, then he would wait for a period which varied according to his patience and temperament, and ultimately would take his departure and buy a silver sauce boat elsewhere. Mr. Bunstable was, and still is, a skilled exponent of this second and earlier form of book selling. He doesn't go in for window dressing and the wares which are visible from the street seem to have been chosen principally for their power to exclude the daylight from the interior of his shop, and secondarily for a lack of interest which shall ensure their remaining undisturbed. If you persist in disregarding the warning of this window, your next difficulty is with the door. Owing to a slight settlement in the fabric of Mr. Bunstable's premises, it's impossible to open this door without the exercise of both strength and skill. But if you do succeed in opening it, then beware of the step which lurks just inside. Inexperienced customers usually arrive in the shop with a crash and a cry of alarm. And perhaps it's because of this that Mr. Bunstable has never troubled to repair the bell which hangs over his lintel and was originally intended to give notice of his client's approach. As your eyes become accustomed to the darkness within, you now detect one or more figures standing more or less erect with their legs more or less twisted round each other and profoundly absorbed in the books which they are reading. Here again, and before they have discovered that these figures are wearing hats, inexperienced customers have mistaken them for members of Mr. Bunstable's staff. But no contretemps has ever arisen from this misapprehension. The figures are so intent on their studies that they're deaf to any words which may be addressed to them and the customer can retrieve his error without any spoken explanation. One imagines that towards closing time, Mr. Bunstable must go round his shop removing the volumes from these students' hands, gently pushing them back into the outer world. But it's almost as easy to suppose that some of them remain there all night, for so far as my own observation goes, Mr. Bunstable regards them as part of the fittings and fixtures. One day I must really go there at closing time and see what happens. Meanwhile, your eyes are becoming more and more acclimatised. You see vistas and vistas of books, books heaped up on the dusty floor, books rising in tears to the mottled ceiling, books on tables, books piled precariously on a stepladder, books bursting out of brown paper parcels, books balanced on the seats of chairs. You long to sneeze, for the violence of your entrance has sent a quantity of dust flying up your nose, but you control yourself, heroically. The atmosphere of the place would make such an action an outrage. It would be worse than sneezing in church. It was at this stage, in my own case, and just as I was wondering how on earth one ever bought anything in this extraordinary shop, that another of my senses was unexpectedly assailed. 
somewhere, for the moment I couldn't tell where, a tune was being whistled, a short, monotonous air which suggested, here we go round the mulberry bush, and other works of that nature, and yet refused to be identified as anything that I had heard before. I looked at the two drugged readers, who were the only other visible occupants of the shop, but the sound wasn't coming from them. Nor, on the other hand, did they give any sign of interest or annoyance at the constant repetition of that little tune. You will sympathise, I hope, when I say that it had now become my most pressing requirement to track the whistler to his lair, and with this object in view, I penetrated still farther into the darkness of the shop, stepping over the heaps of books and the brown paper parcels, and soon losing all sense of direction in a labyrinth of shelves. All this while the tune continued, but as I felt my way forward I noticed another peculiarity about it. The whistler seemed to have some rooted objection to giving us the last note of his melody. Each time that he reached this point, and each time that I was convinced the keynote must be coming, he suddenly broke off, paused for a moment, and began again at the beginning. It was all that I could do not to supply the missing note myself. And yet, if, as I was now coming to believe, the music were proceeding from the proprietor of the shop, this was hardly the conventional way of introducing myself to his notice. Again I controlled myself, and then suddenly, as I turned yet another corner, I beheld the explanation of my puzzle. I was at the door of an inner sanctum, or den, bursting with books also, yet differing from the dusty profusion through which I had come, in that they were all neatly and carefully arranged, and between me and the window, which opened onto a prospect of unrelieved brickwork, there hung a small bird cage. Oh, I exclaimed aloud, a bullfinch! At the same moment a second and human silhouette appeared before the window. Afterwards I saw that it had risen from a large desk, but at the time it had the startling effect of emerging as from a trapdoor, and what with this and my embarrassment having been overheard, I took a hasty step backward. Don't go, sir, said the silhouette. Was there anything I could find for you? It was in this way that I first met Mr. Edward Bunstable, the sole proprietor of the shop which I have attempted to describe, and the individual to whom I owe the story that I am trying to relate. He was, and still is, a shortish gentleman of a genial but a moderate rotundity, the possessor of a beard and a pair of steel-rimmed spectacles. He knows more about out-of-the-way books than anyone I've ever met, and how in the world he keeps his trade going and pays rent, rates and taxes out of it, it's impossible to guess. I've enjoyed the privilege of his acquaintanceship for a number of years now, but though he has frequently shown me volumes which he has bought, I've never been able to discover any volume he has sold. Sometimes I think that he must be an eccentric millionaire, so utterly unbusinesslike are his ways of business. At other times, I'm fain to believe that he's some kind of fairy, or a ghost, or magician, or that he has escaped from the pages of one of his mustiest volumes. But I think this is because secretly he rather enjoys mystifying me. There's been a hint of a twinkle from behind those steel-rimmed spectacles during some of our talks, which seems to me to support this view. I have no idea where he sleeps, when he eats, or what, within about forty years, his age may be. On the other hand, I know all these particulars about his bullfinch, for within three minutes of our first meeting, and while I was still trying to give him the name of the book that I wanted, he had told me that the bullfinch never left his room, that it subsisted on millet seed, and that it was fifteen years old. I bought him cheap, he said because he could never learn the last note of his song. I spent ten years trying to teach it to him, but it was no use. That bird's got character, he has. Oh, yes, I said, uh, but about this book, I was wondering if... That bird, interrupted Mr. Bonstable, is a regular Londoner. He's as sharp as the maid that bird is. He told me a great deal more about his bullfinch's alleged characteristics before I could succeed in giving him the particulars of the book I was after. Then 
He nodded his head with an air of infinite wisdom. I've got it, he said. Uh, I, I just can't lay my hands on it at the moment. But if you were to come back, uh, say in uh, two or three days' time, knowing no better, I did, as I was asked. Mr. Bunstable said that he was still searching for the book. He was more convinced than ever it was somewhere on the premises, but his general attitude towards the affair was that it was no use hurrying things. The suggestion conveyed to me at the time was that if once the book became aware that he was looking for it, it might take fright and disappear for good. After telling me a number of anecdotes of a literary flavour and showing me several of his most recent purchases, which he was careful to explain were not to be included in his stock, he proposed that I should pay him another visit, uh, say in about a week or ten days. I'll be certain to have it for you by then, he added. I, I know I've got it put away somewhere. To cut a long story short, the object of my original inquiry has eluded Mr. Bunstable's search to this day. He is still hopeful about it, though I have long since abandoned any expectation of its ever coming to light, just as I have long since outgrown the whim which made me ask for it. If he should ever find it, of course, I would offer to buy it. This would at least be due to a man who, with a very moderate reckoning, has spent about a fortnight of working days in trying to oblige a customer. I shall not be surprised, however, if, in the event of its turning up, Mr. Bunstable refuses to part with it. For in the meantime, there have been one or two near shaves when I have tried to purchase other volumes from his collection, and each time he's managed to prevent the sale taking place. Uh, Don't take it now, sir, he said. I'll find a better copy, if you'll wait. Or, I wouldn't have it if I were you, sir. There'll be a new edition out in the spring. If I'm still persistent, he enmeshes me in one of his long and hypnotic anecdotes edging me quietly towards the door as he tells it. By this means, I am caused to forget the quest which had drawn me into his shop, and his honour as an old-fashioned bookseller is preserved. An inexplicable old gentleman. Even now, as I set this description on paper, I find myself wondering whether he and his shop can really exist, and perhaps this uncertainty is one of the reasons why I keep on going back there. I want to convince myself that I haven't made it all up. So, we arrive at the story which Mr. Bunstable told me one evening last autumn, beginning it in the recesses of his inner sanctum, with the bullfinch contributing its familiar obligato, and finishing it at the front door of his shop as he bowed me out into the foggy street. A good title for it might be The Lost Tragedy. Personally, said Mr. Bunstable, I'm a great one for reading, and perhaps you'll say that's natural enough. But there have been some big men in my trade, men who are up to all the tricks of the auction room, who'd buy and sell books by the thousand, and yet never read anything but a catalogue or a newspaper, or maybe a railway timetable. Not that they weren't fond of books, but it was the bindings they cared for, or the leaves being uncut, or the first edition, with all the misprints and all the suppressed preface. You know, sir the things that run up the value of a book without any reference to what that book's about. Of course, we've all got to watch out for these details, but to my mind, when all's said and done, a book's a thing to be read. You can't get away from that, sir. But the man I learnt this business from, old Mr. Trumpet, I was twenty years in his shop at Panton Street before I set up on my own, he wouldn't have agreed with me, not he, sir. He'd got an eye for rarities, which was worth a fortune. He got a collection of old editions, which was worth another fortune, and he could run rings round anyone in the sale room. But he didn't worry about what was inside a book, not he. Many a time he's hauled me over the coals for sitting reading in his shop. You stick to the title pages, my boy, he said. That's all a bookseller needs to know about. And I'll say this for Mr. Trumpet. He certainly practised what he preached. He used to travel about a good deal, attending sales outside London or helping in valuations for probate where there was a big library. And sometimes, though not as often as I'd have liked, he'd take me along with him. It was a wonder to me the way he'd go into a room full of books in an old country house, all arranged anyhow 
and with no catalogue or anything to help him. And yet, he'd pick out all the plums within five or ten minutes of getting there. It was almost as if he could smell them out, sir. And canny you'd have called it if you'd seen him on the job. Partly for practice and partly to amuse myself, I'd try sometimes if I couldn't find something valuable that he'd missed. But I can't say that I ever succeeded. The nearest I ever came to it was with this book I'm telling you about. We'd gone down to a big country house where the owner had died to see if we could pick anything up. The young fellow who'd come into the property was all for selling everything that he could. But when it came to the library, the whole place was in such a mess that no one could trouble to make a proper inventory. The auctioneer's instructions were to sell the old books off in bundles as they stood on the shelves. And seeing the quantity of litter there was, I can't say it was a bad idea. The bindings had been pretty good in their day, though that had been some time ago. But as for the stuff inside, well, it was just the typical sermons and county histories and so forth that you could buy up anywhere. A regular lot of rubbish. We got down there on the morning of the day when that part of the sale was coming up, and old Mr. Trumpet didn't take long to size it all up. He marked down a few bundles which might about cover our railway fares if he got them at a proper price. And then he was just thinking about getting some lunch when I pointed out to him that there was a shelf over on one of the doors that we hadn't looked at. Nonsense, he said, for he didn't like admitting he could have missed anything. I saw them when I first came in. Of course, we both knew quite well that he'd done nothing of the sort. But it wasn't going to pay me to get into an argument with him, so I just made up my mind that I'd come back after he'd gone and have a glance at those books myself. Perhaps I'll get a chance, I thought, to show him I'm not so ignorant as he thinks. So, just as we were going out the front door, I pretended I'd left my pencil case in the library and I went back there alone. To my surprise, for I hadn't been gone more than a minute and we certainly hadn't met anyone on the way, there was a gentleman standing on a chair with his back to me, reaching up at that particular shelf over the inner door. He'd got a cloak on rather like people used to wear in Scotland. And as I could see a pair of rough stockings underneath it, I made up my mind he was a golfer. He was running through the books very quickly and anxious-like, but he must have heard my step, for he stopped suddenly and turned round on his chair. He was rather a short gentleman and a bit pale, rather thin on top, if you know what I mean, and with a little pointed beard. It struck me that I'd seen him somewhere before, or or else his photograph, but I couldn't put a name to him at the time, and of course, well, I'll come to that later. He was looking at me so curiously that I felt I had to say something, so I thought I'd better explain what I'd come back for. Um, When you finished, sir, I said, I wanted to have a look through that that shelf uh, for myself, and as he didn't answer, though I was certain he'd heard me quite clearly, I added, "Um, I've just come down from London, Uh, for the sale. He nodded very gravely and politely and turned back to the bookshelf. He kept on taking out one volume after another and shoving them back again as soon as he'd looked inside. Then, all of a sudden, he gave a little gasp and I saw him staring at an old quarto bound in calf that he'd just opened. The next moment, he'd popped it under his cloak and jumped off the chair. Oh well, I'd seen some pretty cool customers in the book trade before now, but this seemed to me to be a bit too cool. Here, I called out, backing between him and the doorway. What are you doing with that book? You can't take it away like that. Can't I? He said, and it seemed to me that he spoke like some kind of West Countryman. It's mine. But you're not Mr. Hatteras, are you? I asked, naming the heir to the property. For, you see, this gentleman was about fifty, I should judge. No, he said, but a book is mine. If I choose to take it with me, what is that to you? It should never have been printed. Well, sir, at that last remark of his, I'll admit that I thought he was a little bit, um, well, you know what I mean. Here, Mr. Bunstable tapped his forehead expressively. But that didn't seem to me any reason why he should make off with something that wasn't his. Look here, sir, I said, I don't want to make any trouble but I saw you putting a book from that shelf under your cloak, and unless you put it back where it came from, 
I shall have to tell the auctioneer. The auctioneer, he repeated, looking a bit puzzled. Yes, I said. If you want to take any book out of this room, you can bid for it at a sale this afternoon. And as he still looked kind of silly, I pointed to the card that had been pinned over the shelf. Lot 56, I said. If you want that book, the proper way to get it is to bid for Lot 56. For a moment, I thought he was going to make a dash past me, but I wasn't surprised when he changed his mind, for he was a very nervous-looking gentleman, and he wouldn't have stood much chance if I'd wanted to stop him. So be it, he said, and he climbed onto the chair again and put the book back where he'd found it. Then, with a funny sort of look at me, he went straight out of the room. I wonder where I've seen that face before, I kept on thinking, but still I couldn't put a name to it. Well, sir, by this time I saw that if I was going to get any lunch I should have to run for it, and as I was a young man in those days I decided to leave that last bookshelf and try to slip in again before the sale started. As I was going out through the hall, I ran into the auctioneer's clerk and I thought it mightn't be a bad idea if I told him what I'd seen. All right, he said when I'd finished, I'll lock the library door if there's anything of that sort going on. But did you say the gentleman had come out just now? Yes, I said, just about a minute before I did. That's funny, he answered. I was in the hall here the whole time, and I could have sworn nobody came by. Well, it was funny, if you see what I mean, sir. We both laughed a good deal at the time. Though apart from the principle of the thing I said, there's precious few books in there that are worth more than sixpence. That's as it may be, said the clerk cautiously, and I left him and hurried off to the inn. When I told Mr. Trumpet, he said, Hmm, that sounds like Badger of Liverpool. He'll get shut up one of these days if he's not careful. And he pulled out his copy of the sale catalogue and made a pencil mark against lot 56. He's a cunning old bird, he added. If there's anything I've missed... We'll give him a run for his money. And we did. I had no opportunity of seeing that shelf again, for the library was still locked when I got back, and the sale was to take place in the dining room. But there was Mr. Badger of Liverpool, in his cloak and his golf stockings, watching each lot as it came up and was knocked down. And when we got to lot 56, he started bidding like a good un. Mr. Trumpet sat there nodding his head to the auctioneer but everyone but these two had soon dropped out. But when the price for the odd dozen books had run up to a hundred and twenty-five pounds, I suppose he'd felt he'd gone far enough for a pig in a poke. He closed his eyes and shook his head in the way he had when he'd finished bidding, and the auctioneer brought his hammer down with a thump. Of course, I thought we'd heard the last of Lot 56, but just as I was crossing it off my list, I heard the auctioneer having some kind of argument with a successful bidder. These are no good to me, he was saying, holding out a handful of coins. I can't take foreign money for my deposit. Mr. Badger was a very nervous-looking gentleman, as I think I've told you, and he didn't seem to know what to make of this. He kept on snapping his fingers and starting sentences that he couldn't finish. But it was no use. The auctioneer simply dropped the money on his desk for Mr. Badger to take or leave as he chose, and announced that he was putting the lot up again. The little mystery and excitement that they'd been sent it up to £7.10, but at that figure the competition stopped, and Mr. Trumpet got what he'd wanted. I could see the auctioneer looking pretty sick, but he was quite right, of course. Whatever those coins were, they'd have been no good to his employers. Why, some of them were scarcely even round. Well, sir, we stopped on and picked up one or two more lots, and when we'd arranged for having them sent up to London, we took a fly back to the station and caught our train. In the carriage, I suddenly remembered rather a curious thing, and I mentioned it to Mr. Trumpet. Did you see where Mr. Badger went to? I asked. I never saw him leaving the room, but he wasn't there when we came away. That, I'll swear. Mr. Trumpet looked at me quite queer-like. Badger, he repeated. What do you mean? But why, I said, the gentleman who bid against you, sir, for lot 56. That wasn't Badger, he says. Uh, then who was it, says I, but Mr. Trumpet had no idea. I feel as if I've seen his face somewhere, he said presently, or else he's very like someone I've met, but I'm bothered if I can place him. If you ask me, he said a little later on, he'd broken loose from somewhere. Did you see the way his eyes were rolling? 
Yes, I said, quite a fine frenzy, wasn't it? But of course, my little literary illusion was wasted on Mr. Trumpet. He only grunted, and we dropped the subject for good. Well, resumed Mr. Bunstable, who had now got me out of his labyrinth into the main part of the shop. A few days after that, the packing case came along from the sale, and though Mr. Trumpet would likely have let it lie in his cellar for weeks, for he took his time over most things, I thought I'd go down and look through the stuff myself. You see, I'd still got it in the back of my head that our golfing friend might have known a bit more than we'd given him credit for, that there really might be some sort of find in Lot 56, and if there was, then I meant to get to the bottom of it. So late that afternoon, I took a candle down to the cellar, with no gas except in the shop itself in those days, and I got a tack lifter and a hammer and started opening the case. Out it all came, most of it just about fit for a barrow in the street, though every now and then I'd find one of the books that Mr. Trumpet had spotted, and presently I got right down to the straw, and there, the last book to come out, was the calf-bound quarto that the gentleman in the cloak had tried to make away with. The label had come off the back, and the leaves were still uncut, but when I turned to the title page, well, I tell you, sir, I thought, for a moment, I must be dreaming. What would you say, sir, I wonder, if you picked up an old book and found it was a play by Shakespeare that no one had even imagined as existing? Would you believe your eyes? I tell you, I could hardly believe mine. Yet there it was, paper, type and binding, all above suspicion, as I knew well enough, and on the title page, The Tragedy of Alexander the Great by Mr. William Shakespeare. I felt like Christopher Columbus and Marconi rolled into one, the biggest discovery of the century, and I, down there by myself in Mr. Trumpet's cellar, had made it. I sat down on the edge of that packing case and fairly gasped for breath. It was the most tremendous moment of my life. Of course, I knew it was my real duty to rush up the ladder into the shop and tell Mr. Trumpet what I'd found, and of course I meant to do this as soon as I'd collected my wits. But while I sat there staring at that title page, I realised more and more clearly what Mr. Trumpet would do. The book would go straight into his safe, uncut as it was, so as to keep up the value. When it left the safe, it would be to go direct to the sale room, and from there, unless an act of Parliament stopped it, to an American collector. If I carried out my duty without a thought of the consequences, my first opportunity of reading The Tragedy of Alexander the Great would be in a facsimile or reprint, just as if the original had never been in my hands at all. And I wanted to read it. Now. I was enough of a bookseller to recognise its enormous value, but unlike Mr. Trumpet, I was too much of a book lover to let an American collector read it first. I wasn't going to cut the leaves, of course. I knew better than to do that. But there were pretty wide margins, and by twisting the pages carefully I could manage well enough. And so, sitting down on a packing case, and by the light of my candle, I began right away. Act One. Scene One. A room in King Philip's palace. Yes, sir, I remember that. But I'm thankful that I can't remember any more. Did I say thankful? Well, sir, I'm afraid I mean it. I don't pretend to be a poet myself, and in the ordinary way I'll admit there may be better critics, but when it comes to a real piece of downright incompetent, careless writing, of bad scansion and worse grammar, of loud-sounding, pretentious and meaningless claptrap, then I'll take leave to say that I'm as good a judge as most men. It was awful, sir. It was terrible. It was like a parody of the worst kind of Elizabethan poetry, and yet, if you see what I mean, it was Elizabethan poetry. Not a word, not a phrase to give the show away, as there are in Chatterton's forgeries. It was like Shakespeare read through some kind of distorting lens with all the faults and weaknesses, for he had faults and weaknesses, sir, 
magnified ten thousand times, and all the beauty cancelled right out. No wonder they kept this out of the first folio, I kept on telling myself, and yet I couldn't put it down. However bad it might be, it was, unless some contemporary had played an expensive practical joke, the discovery that I'd taken it for, and I was the first of my own contemporaries to read it. In spite of myself, though, my excitement had given way to an almost overwhelming sense of depression. If you're really fond of books, sir, there's always the way a piece of thoroughly bad workmanship takes you. I don't know how long I'd been down in that cellar, resumed Mr. Bunstable, after a short and mournful pause, when all of a sudden I heard a kind of thud overhead, and looking up, I saw that someone had closed the trap at the top of the ladder. Good heavens, I thought. There's Mr. Trumpet going off for the night, and if I don't hurry after him, I shall be locked in. I jumped up, picked up my candle, and was just moving to the foot of the ladder, when, to my astonishment, I saw that two men were standing in my way. It seemed to me that they were in some kind of fancy dress, and what with this and my bewilderment at the way they'd managed to get in, I very nearly dropped the candle. Then, as I recovered it, I recognised the shorter of them. It was the old country gentleman. I'd seen last week at the sale down in the country the gentleman that I'd taken for Mr. Badger of Liverpool. What's the matter? I asked in a shaking kind of voice. Uh, What do you want, sir? He didn't answer me, but turned to his companion, a big, burly sort of fellow who struck me as knowing pretty well what the bottom of a pint pot looked like. Did you bolt the trap, Ben? he asked. Are you sure the old man's gone? What do you take me for? said the big fellow, speaking with a kind of rough cockney accent. Course he's gone. Now nah, then, he added, looking at me. We've come for that book. Where have you put it? I had it under my arm, but before I could answer him, he'd spotted. Aha, he called her. There you are, Will. What did I tell you? Didn't I say we'd find it here? They both seemed tremendously excited, and I was convinced that they'd been drinking. But I wasn't going to stand any nonsense. I don't know what you're doing here, I said, retreating behind the packing case, or how you forced your way in, but this book has been bought and paid for by my employer, Mr. Trumpet. Let me remind you that you've no right in the private part of the shop. The big man only laughed at this, but the other started talking sixteen to the dozen. Let me tell you, he said, that that book was published without any authority, that the script was stolen from the theatre, and that anyone who keeps it as a receiver of stolen goods. Do you know what I spent in buying up that edition from the blackguard who printed it? Two hundred angels. And do you know how long I'd been hunting for the copy he kept back? Nearly three hundred years. But I found it at last, and I'm going to see that it's destroyed. I've got my reputation to protect the same as anyone else, and if I did a bit of pot boiling because I'd got into debt, That's no reason why it should be brought up against me now. I've had enough trouble over Pericles and Titus Andronicus without being saddled with a bit of balderdash like Alexander the Great. You got the better of me down in Gloucestershire last week, but it's my turn now. I've got good friends I have who'll see that justice is done. If I'm a bit scant of breath myself, here's my old colleague Johnson, who's killed a man more than once. We'll do it again for the honour of the profession. Now then, young sir, are you going to hand that play over, or do you want to taste a Ben's dagger in your gullet? That's the way you ran on, sir, though I might not have got all his words quite right, and all the time the other man was rocking and shaking with laughter. I was so scared I could hardly think, for it was no joke being shut up down there with these two fellows like that. Mad they might be or drunk, or both together, but whatever they were, I could see they would stick at nothing. And yet... Well, sir, it's no use reproaching myself now, and besides, after all these years, I'm not at all sure that the actual upshot wasn't the best for everybody. The big fellow had jumped right over the packing case and twisted my arms together behind my back, while the little one snatched the book from where it had fallen tore out the sheets and burnt them one by one in the flame of my candle. Then he threw the empty binding down on the cellar floor. All's well, ends well, he said. 
He's had his lesson, Ben. You can let him go. And then he stooped down and blew out the candle. As he reached this stage in his remarkable narrative, Mr. Bunstable stretched past me with one hand and opened the door of his shop. A cold draught accompanied by wisps of London fog blew in through the aperture, causing me to shiver and Mr. Bunstable to utter his little dry grating cough. Far away I heard the indomitable bullfinch once more embarking on his incomplete melody. The rest was silence. You mean, I said presently, that it was a dream? Eh? said Mr. Bunstable, starting from his thoughts. Well, sir, as to that, I should hardly like to say. I certainly spent the night in that cellar, as Mr. Trumpet could tell you if he were alive, and I'll have to admit that there were no traces of that book on the floor, no ashes even, when I looked for them in the morning. And yet, that doesn't seem to me to explain everything. Because, sir, there was no calf-bound quarter there either. You've only got my word for it, of course, but... And here, gently but firmly, Mr. Bunstable shut me out into the fog. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back. We didn't really need the sinister music for that, did we? Because it wasn't very sinister. That was The Lost Tragedy by Dennis McHale. Uh, Dennis John McHale was born in June in London in 1892, and he was rather well connected. His mother was the daughter of the famous pre-Raphaelite painter Edward Byrne Jones, and his father, uh, although more humble, his father was born on the Isle of Bute in Scotland, where his father was a church minister. But his, his dad became a pretty distinguished academic and was at Oxford, was professor of poetry, was an expert in Latin literature, was president of the British Academy in the, in the early 1930s. So his dad was quite probably more famous than Dennis McHale himself. His elder sister, Angela Thurkle, was an, also a novelist, and he was more distantly related to Rudyard Kipling and Stanley Baldwin. So he was educated at uh, St. Paul's School in London, which is a, a prestigious private school in London. He went to uh, Oxford, but his ill health stopped him finishing his degree. Now, the interesting thing about that is he, he suffered from this ill health. What, I haven't been able to discover what kind of ill health it was. There is a hint that he had a nervous breakdown, so I wonder whether it was an anxiety-related disorder. His first job was working for... J.M. Barry, and he worked as a set designer in the London theatre. And, you know, J.M. Barry, Peter Pan, and I think we've done a story of J.M. Barry's before, at the Ghost of Christmas present, I think, or the Ghost of Christmas Eve, I forget. Anyway, I'll, it'll be around at Christmas. McHale, Dennis McHale, although his family were pretty wealthy, he himself seems to have had to write for a living. So whether his income, whether he wasn't left enough money, I'm not sure his dad would have been that rich, really, being an academic, but certainly his mother, coming from Byrne Jones. But you don't know what it's like in families, do you? You really don't know. He, had, and he, he was a very prolific writer, and he wrote a novel every year from 1920 to 1938, and the very well regarded, um, his uh, most famous novel is Greenery Street, which uh, is about a young upper-middle-class family setting up home in London in um, Greenery Street. They call it this Walpole Street. And when you do your research, you see that in the book, which apparently I haven't read actually, but say, people say it's delightful, very light and comic. And from reading, I just read a couple of excerpts from it there, very brief excerpts. And the sort of characters are like the P.J. Woodhouse type thing, you know, Jeeves and Worcester type life, that they're not as overtly comic as that. Um, but, you know, you, he was actually, um, McHale was friends with uh, P.J. Woodhouse and A.A. Milne, who wrote Winnie the Pooh. And of course, so that circle, Jay and Barry and all of these people were all around in London at that time. And he moved in those circles. He actually wrote the biography of Jay and Barry. And there's an, a nice audio clip about how they told him to cut it down. He was apparently very tall and very handsome. And um, there is another clip of, uh, about the, on the Jay and Barry website about how they, the woman who's talking said she was in love with him at one point. 
But he seems to have been a really faithful guy, besotted with his wife. He dedicated his stories to his wife. And she died in 1949. And he stopped writing. He stayed and lived quietly for another 22 years. And he died himself when he was 79. So that is quite romantic, really, and quite nice. You can see, so we're talking about comic writing, aren't we? So I need now to move on to the story of the lost tragedy. And I need to say something about genre expectations, because it may be that some of our listeners have become unhappy, because this is not a scary story. It's not even, it is a supernatural story, clearly, but it's not a a, a moody, there's no shadows and ghosts and vampires and things that go bump in the night. It's rather endearing, really, isn't it? It's quite a sweet story. And so it's, it's, a, it's a comic ghost story, which is a subgenre of its own. But, you know, I found, and if you, if you just read reviews of books, you'll find that if, if people... Actually, I was listening to a Neil Gaiman talking about this, and he was saying, you know, if you write a genre, genre story, if you write a hard military science fiction story, it better be that. And if you write a, a, a clean romance, it better be. And my own, my own uh, experience was writing what they call lit RPG. I mean, if you've come across my Dark Worlds book, you'll see that's lit RPG. I wrote um, another series under a pen name, and I couldn't help my sense of humour running away with me. And, you know, the hardcore lit RPG people, they, it was not what they were looking for. You know, some people want what they want. I only say this because it may be that other people are, who listen to this are very, very angry by now. How dare you sell us a, go- a comic ghost story? It is a subgenre. There's actually a volume. I was looking at the, looking, when you do your research when you're looking into these things. 1922, there was, a, there was a volume of humorous ghost stories produced. And if you think about possibly the first one is, I'm sure it isn't the first one, but the first famous one is Oscar Wilde's The Canterville Ghost, published in 1887. And then, you, you know, we go through these, and, and there's Richard Middleton, who we've done a story of his. He's, one of his most famous stories is The Ghost Ship, which is about a ghostly pirate ship that lands in a turnip field, and the ghost pirates get all the villagers drunk. And you've got things like Casper the Friendly Ghost, who was obviously a cartoon character from the 1940s right through. I loved Casper. I'm not quite that old. But I, I loved Casper. And then Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, which came out in 1971. You know, again, comic. The, so the comic ghost story is an honourable genre of its own. The other references I got from this as I was reading through were, it reminded me a little bit the picture of the, the shop on the London street with the fog outside that you go into to shelter from the fog. And it's like a little oasis. Reminded me of uh, Cynthia Asquith's The Corner Shop, which we've done, of course. But there are other kind of bookshops. I mean, if, if you watch Black Books on um, the TV program, the, <laughs> sort of this, it reminds me of that kind of bookshop where you, you know, they don't really want to sell you anything. They actually don't really particularly want you as their customer unless you meet their standards. So, and they don't want to part with the books. If there are other references to that, I mean, Foils itself. I remember when I first went to Foils, probably, yeah, probably the very beginning of the 80s. And I couldn't believe, I'd been to the Soviet Union by then, and I couldn't believe how they were operating the same system. So if you wanted a book, you had to go, take your book to one counter, they gave you a slip, which you then took to the paying counter, you paid there, then came back and got your book, and you had to queue at both counters. It was like really the Soviet system, and the old foils, it was just floors and floors and floors of books all crammed in. Honestly, you couldn't really find anything in a systematic way. Um, It it was vaguely organised, but that meant there were great discoveries to be made, things that you weren't particularly looking for, and hidden corners and things like that. Of course, it's a much more, uh, it's still a fantastic bookshop, but it's a much more modern thing. What happened to me was I left London, didn't go back for a bit, and when I went back, they'd knocked the old files down and made this new one. So that was, a, that was a knocking out a big hole in my past. I spent a lot of time in there. Saved my life. Certainly some of the books I got there, uh, when I was miserable, they absolutely brightened my life. The books I got in foils. There you go. The power of books, great, aren't they? They really are great. And then there's another, there's a story I need to mention. One of my other favourites is by, uh, she we only wrote it when she was 19, a woman called Victoria Walker. That's her maiden name. So she's called something else now. 
and she wrote The Winter of Enchantment, which is a lovely kid's story. And in, there is a shop like that, not a bookshop, but an antique shop. You just imagine stepping off the foggy London street into this um, wonderland, really. I don't know what the bullfinch is going to do with anything. So I was going to say the story is quite well constructed. It's clearly well written. But as to what the bullfinch, well, I don't get that, what that has to do with the story. Probably these days, a modern editor wouldn't let you write that. They'd say, what's this got to do with the story? Cut it out. It's a frame story. And we see that with the ghost stories, they are often done as frame stories, whereby a, a totally unrelated person, if you think of the turn of the screw, it's just the same. A totally unrelated person meets someone who recounts them a tale where there were supernatural happenings. And if you remember how um, M.R. James, and I've quoted this loads of times, but he says, if you're going to write a ghost story, you've got to remove it from the everyday and usually do that by placing it in the past. And actually, you can do it not so far past, so it's kind of unrelatable. Although you can put a ghost story whenever you want, but just just out of reach in the past where things are relatively familiar, but far enough in a, away to allow the strange. So there is an unfamiliarity as well. Or you can put it in a in a, in a foreign country. So obviously Dracula is in Transylvania. Carmilla is in Styria. And you think of the house on the borderland, which is set in the rural west of Ireland, which at the time it was written was a fairly um, remote place to most of the urban readers. Or you could put it in the, if you think of uh, Blackwood um, and the Wendigo, which is in the can Canadian wilderness. Or uh, he does the Willows, which is in this kind of... Um, mid-European wilderness. So you can, you can do it both ways, but I digress because that isn't a big feature of this story, but he put places in the past. And, and he sets up Shakespeare, of course. There are, there are comic turns for those who know. So, it, you know, he keeps saying that this man's, oh, this man's face is familiar. And how he talks with a West Country accent, which I guess to the urban London ear, that's what Warwickshire would sound like. Like in the arches, if that... <laughs> That, because that's Midlands, isn't it? It's Mid Warwickshire is the Midlands, but it's a rural part, a very pretty part of the Midlands as well. I went to a wedding there a while ago, but a lovely place, Henley and Arden. Oh, the only thing I wanted to say was burnt. Uh, when I was reading it, I noticed burnt, not burned, but burnt. Now, one of my little bugbears is if you go through these Grammarly or these apps uh, that make you write properly, make you write proper, and they don't like uh, adverbs, oh no. They will tell you that the British say burnt and the Americans say burned, you know. And I do not think the distinction is so hard and fast. I've come across American writers who write burnt and s slipped, I get, yeah, maybe not slipped. Things like leapt and leaped might be a British Americans. This um, reduction of the ED at the end into a t, burnt, slipped, you know, leapt is just a dialect feature. And it, that devoicing at the end is very common in, in West Germanic languages. Scots does it, Dutch does it, G uh, German does it, you know. B yeah, by the by. So that, that da ta ta But if, you, if I have any interest in this, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I'll, I'll just shut up. So I don't think it is. I think uh, Americans can say s burnt. But correct me if I'm wrong. What do the Canadians do? That's always a good question, isn't it? I would say let's just do what the Canadians do because that's a happy medium. And there's other some words that come across on, on YouTube, like uh, a follow up. I do all sorts of things. YouTube is my god. So, Tonify. I was, this Tonify your abs. But no, it's just tone, isn't it? I'll tone my abs, of course, which I do every day. I don't need to tonify them. And the other word that makes me smile is burglarize. You know, we would just say burgle. He burgled the house. He didn't burglarize the house. But if you've got to do this, that's fine. It's all very creative and lovely. And uh, it just, it just the world is a, sun, a constant source of wonder. Anyway, that is it. Not too much. Oh, yes. I keep forgetting to do the professional bit and say, please, if you like what we're doing, that is me, really. If you like what I'm doing, that's the royal we, you know. I, I must feel I'm royalty to talk about myself as we. It's just like you do, you talk about we, we, we. And I suppose I've got Imogen, who helps me out. And I gave her a driving lesson today. 
And I'm going to get my Catherine to do uh, some, I'm going to do, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do some more live stuff uh, if we get unlocked down properly. On the 8th of July, I'm doing my first live storytelling. I'm hoping to have a good camera by then and get somebody to film it. And I'm ha- ask, hoping Catherine will do it. I would really love to do a, a tour, you know, go places and have people come and listen and, and pay for my trips. But ugh, who knows? I'm grateful to everybody's support. I'm grateful to all my Patreons, YouTube members, my Substack people who actually shell out the cash. So that really keeps me going and allows me to sit and spend more of my time doing this. So thank you. Yeah, the professional bit is to say, if you like the stuff, share it with somebody. Send a kind review. That always helps. On YouTube, like and subscribe. On podcasts where you can do a review. I think it's probably just Apple and Stitcher and places like that and Podchaser. Those reviews are all really helpful. And just spread the news, really. That's it. So yeah, but I've got to remember my call to action. So like, subscribe, share, all of that. And all of these stories I'm doing at the moment are the, the, the requests. So these are all requested by people and I need to remember who's requested them. Yeah, that is a, a fault. I forget who's requested. So somebody requested this and I've forgotten who it is. So I'm really, really sorry I've forgotten because thank you because I really liked it. Because it was funny. Anyway, that's it. Bye. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back, don't they? Isn't that so? Everybody come back, don't they? Isn't that so? Everybody come back, don't they? Isn't that so? Everybody come back, don't they? Isn't that so?